That is the music of Slink once again. I mean, I'm just totally hooked on what this guy does for music. I mean, it's got a little bit of dance stuff in it, a little bit of funky stuff in it, and kick-ass guitar. I mean, I, I never thought that this kind of combination of electronic music with uh, guitars would actually go together as well as it has in a lot of the tracks that he does. He does have a YouTube channel as well that I highly recommend that folks check out because, yeah, it's, it's got some... He, he submits good music to the YouTube audio library. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you got Twitch DMCA and everything going on right now over on Twitch and streamers are going crazy. Like, oh, I'm never going to have good music in my stream ever again. I don't believe that for a second. I think these people just don't want to put in the effort to give some of these artists who are not commercial music artists a chance. Just look, sorry. Sorry. I don't care if you think people are getting away with streaming Ariana Grande music. Look, the people out there that are making the stuff on NCS and they're making the stuff on the YTAL and they're making the stuff on Monster Cat and they're making the stuff on Pretzel. They're people too. This isn't some robot algorithm creating music just so there's haha non-copyright music or whatever, which all music is copyrighted, by the way. It's just a matter of what the rights holder chooses to do in terms of letting people play what they have, whether or not they're going to enforce their own copyrights with the stuff that they create. The people that are joining these music services understand that the very point of the business existing is so that people don't have to worry about about nonsense on their online media. So that's part of them getting into what is they're getting into with the licensing side of it. So it's something that the artist has to choose to do. And quite frankly, some of this stuff sounds good enough that I think that some of these artists who I've been plugging and playing their music in streams and stuff, I think they deserve, I think they, they're, they've made a sacrifice to get their name out there. I, I think they deserve more recognition and more plays on their YouTube videos to send more ad revenue their way and other ways of supporting them as well. Like in the case of some of these artists that do both non-copyright, haha, whatever, and commercial stuff, listen to the, uh, use the stuff in your show, but then go around and, you know, purchase their music on sound, uh, you know, on Spotify or whatever it is, whatever service you use these days. I don't go too wild with digital music. I've actually been traditionally skeptical of digital music because I always wondered what if your account got hacked or what if, you know, what if you lost your internet connection for a bit or things like that. So I've, I've been digitizing CDs for a long time, but now you have services with cloud backups and all kinds of other fancy stuff that have addressed my concerns. I would probably be more a lot more open to digital music now than I've ever been. Just that most of the music collecting that I've done over the years was when, you know, CDs were still the best thing to buy. So even after the digital music revolution iPods and things like that came out. It was still, I think what it was, was the bit rates would not be as high as you could get with CD digitization software. So I was going crazy with digitizing CDs for the longest time. Nowadays though, given how things have panned out, I think a lot of us multimedia nerds have kind of gotten over ourselves a little with maybe little tiny details in the quality that we may be able to hear or not hear, depending on what system we have. I mean, if you have an incredible audio system, you will hear if you're playing 128 kilobit per second MP3 and you hear the compression elements of it as well, you will hear that. But over like Bluetooth speaker in the kitchen or something like that, if you just want music somewhere, you know, that it's really the sort of thing where I think audio needs an enthusiast format not unlike that of Blu-ray. So that way, if you want the absolute best quality everything to play through your absolute best quality system, you have an option. CDs, I don't know. <laughs> so that's really the situation here. Now, tonight we have to talk about YouTube versus Twitch. And tonight we need to address what is probably the worst. We The worst misconception about 2020 for me that it's just it's this is this got nuts a long time ago so let me just say it right up front as we stream in the middle of a as we stream in the middle of a nor'easter mix of rain wind and snow the stream abruptly stops the power got knocked out Woo! but this is the last night of freedom before the nine to fivers go crazy this week and i'm probably just doing videos and working and sleeping because i'll be not be able to stream much if at all after tonight. So here's the situation. I cannot believe just how much hatred there is out there 
when you say you're getting involved with Twitch after being on YouTube for a long time? Not even saying, you know, not even that you're going to leave YouTube per se, but just that you're giving this other platform a chance. I cannot believe what I've dealt with because of this crap. This got nuts a long time ago. So here's the situation. The tech videos attracted people who really didn't care what I was doing. They just wanted to see me tinker with the same computers over and over again. It's not what this channel was about. Not in 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, etc. It's just that I've had this nasty tendency to go off on tangents with things. There have been times when I've vlogged too much instead of making the kinds of videos I wanted to make involving technology and multimedia. There have been times when I've tried new things and the new toy effect was shoom, crazy. And I'm one of those people that really wants to know what I'm talking about. So I will hit the ground running, hit the books, and try and learn new things. So in the case of streaming, the, th the reason why I became a streamer of any kind, Twitch, YouTube, or otherwise, is because it got to the point frontier... Frontier Communications, their lack of investment in this neck of the woods got to the point where it was uncompetitive. I was paying $70 a month for internet service that would never, because the equipment was obsolete, give me the upload bandwidth necessary to do live streaming. I could live stream in standard def, so I'd always look pretty terrible. I would never have a chance of having any good presentation value whatsoever in the live streaming world with Frontier. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the hillbilly cable company around here, <laughs> yeah, is is aggressively trying to crush Frontier. <laughs> so there are up, there are regular upgrades, and you know stuff that wasn't all that much better than Frontier five years ago now blows them out of the water. So the packages they had available, and here's the fun part: right around the time. I, I told I talked to the representatives. I said, look, I want to I'm used to taking care of my own stuff. I don't want to pay modem fees. And I said, look, can I just buy my own modem? Yeah, sure. Make sure it's Doxus 3 because make sure it's Doxus 3 1 or whatever it was. Go, we're going to a new Doxus standard. So don't buy, you know, this just make sure it's going to be expensive, but it's going to last you a few years. So I went, I bought the Motorola box that has been running quite nicely since I set it up and it's doing quite well for itself technology baby and so upgrade the whole actually the whole network there's a couple of things i need to upgrade in order to maximize the speed that i can get from what's available nowadays it, it's going to be 100 plus dollars to do that though for the first time ever the old traditional bottleneck between ethernet and internet was no more and i actually had to work on upgrading my home network i mean i i lived out in dsl country for years so i lived out in dsl country for years and, you know, there was always this thing where you didn't care about your home network except transferring files between computers because your home network was always going to blow away your internet speed. So <laughs> it's just, it's a shock to the system that technology has caught up on the internet side of things without costing an arm and a leg. I'm actually, for less than what I was paying Frontier, notably less, get way better speeds. So Frontier... The only reason anybody would buy any kind of internet service from Frontier where I'm at is because they hate the cable company. That's it. There is zero reason to buy any of that stuff. You will not be able to live stream in HD. It's not going to work. You know, you're not going to have the upload speed for it. And here's the fun part. Next Doxus standard, Doxus 4, introduces more synchronous connections. So finally, I can stop being jealous of the Verizon Fios people who can buy 7575. You know, I can stop being jealous of those for of the fiber people for their synchronous connections. It's it's something where I don't know when the this hillbilly ISP is going to uh, adopt it. It's it's a no name by the way. It's not like Comcast or anything. We're I'm too far out in the woods for Comcast. <laughs> but when that comes out one of the first things I'm going to ask is I'm going to say hey, synchronous, synchronous, synchronous. What's your what's your fiber killer, basically, because it's more worth it in terms of buying newer Internet packages for me to get a synchronous connection than to keep getting more download speed. And I think there's a lot of people, a lot of tech nerds out there that are going to agree with me on this. So. <sighs>
So that's why I got into streaming, because it's finally doable around here. With the kind of, you know, with how I get into stuff like this, and with how people tell me, you sound like a radio guy, you should jump on the radio, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, my contrived radio style series, which was podcasts in YouTube video form, which, by the way, only a few of them really got any decent amounts of views anyway. So nobody's fooled here. Even if it sounds good, you can listen to it like a podcast and people can literally put anything on YouTube these days format wise because YouTube even has officially sanctioned topic videos generated by the content ID system that just have a graphic with audio playing. Despite all of that there's still a difference between something you can still edit and having to be able to do a live discussion like this. Something that would count as practice for if I wanted to go do a show at a radio station or something like that. And just what has happened with live streaming in the last couple of years that it made YouTube of all companies do an about face and start developing their own offerings, lest they be left behind. This is a shocker for me. Cold ones, baby. This is a shocker for me. Because I'm used to YouTube just floating around on top of everything. Like, oh, yeah, we're the best. And they don't really have to care. But Facebook aggressively chasing their technology and Twitch making live streaming into such a thing that people would rather live stream than make videos these days. There are still, if you do some digging and do your, you know, do some homework on the matter. There are still some ways in which videos are better than live streaming. There are still some formats where videos are better than live streaming, and I know that. That's why these daily updates or whatever, whatever, whenever we're just hanging out and I'm just talking about stuff like this, that's why this is going to be just one thing I do on this channel. But it's not going to be the best thing I do on this channel. You'll notice I've stopped the radio style series. That's because I don't think topical discussions like that are best done live. I think it'd be better if I just put something together, either podcast style like this, Bring the radio style series back to YouTube and make stuff. Don't stream stuff. Edit stuff together and do something like that. But if I'm going to do that, I might as well make videos about the multimedia meta like some of these commentators do. That would make me less of a weirdo off doing his own thing in the corner and more in line with the way people do stuff. So that's the reason why I got into streaming is that internet service around here. Let's get rid of this. Internet service around here actually got better to the point where it's now viable for the first time ever. So, but the hatred that I've gotten because, oh, I don't like Twitch. I'm never watching Twitch. I don't care what you're doing on Twitch. I'm never watching your streams. Blah, 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 blah. You can stream anything. And I'm not going to watch it. I cannot believe the hatred that I've gotten from people that are so elitist about YouTube that they will not give any other platforms a chance. Here's the ugly history of my channel that you folks will be very, very disappointed by. I've been giving other platforms a chance for years because I know that competition makes these businesses better. Let me put the cat neck pillow here. Yeah, it's a neck pillow. Got this last year. So this kind of looks cute. So you got to wash it a bit, though. It's getting a little it's from last year. So it's, yeah. So competition makes these platforms better. When platforms don't have to compete, they get complacent. When businesses don't have to compete, they get complacent. When Intel, for example, had a monopoly on processors for all the way up to the one gigahertz mark, we slogged along to one gigahertz, then maybe two gigahertz or whatnot. That's when AMD started getting in on the action and suddenly, oh yeah, we're heading back to two gigahertz now and you know we're, we're, we're gonna get faster and better and things like that. But Intel just slogged along for years not having to care. Then they slogged along again before Ryzen came out and computers stayed four cores for way too long. So, I mean, this is something that we know that businesses do if they don't have competition and platforms do this, too. I know people complain about Susan Wojcicki and her various completely out of left field comments anytime she says anything. Twitter or otherwise, seems like she's completely out of touch with her platform. Same thing with Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Number one criticism I hear of Mark Zuckerberg is he of Z Mark Zuckerberg is he doesn't get why Facebook people are upset with the platform. And the same thing is true with Emmett Shear and Twitch. Emmett Shear should be fired. Blah blah blah. He should leave the company. He's completely out of touch. Twitch will never be successful with Emmett Shear in charge. So literally. 
the three major platforms when it comes to streaming and potentially videos if Twitch got in on it. The three major platforms in this space all have CEOs that are complained about for the exact same stuff. See where I'm coming from here? Susan Wojcicki is out of touch. Mark Zuckerberg is out of touch. Emmett Shear is out of touch. Literally the exact same complaints and general direction of criticism for three executives of the three major companies. So just look, you got to be objective here. Competition makes these companies better. When I say, when I look like a YouTube fanboy, say, yeah, Team Red Ascendant, that's because YouTube is working on teams at YouTube are working on some pretty good stuff, showing that there is some competitive spirit within YouTube, despite what's been going on over the last 15 years. So when YouTube does something that's good, I'm going to say they've done something good. When Twitch does something that's good, I'm going to say Twitch has done something that's good. When Twitch does something bad, like DMCA, I'm going to say Twitch has done something bad. And that is probably the showstopper for Twitch's success is no plan for DMCA besides strikes only. You just poke around on Twitter. Go look on Twitter. Twitch can't even announce new features now without people showing up demanding a follow-up for DMCA. There is no such thing as Twitch coming up with a good idea anymore in the eyes of the general public, on Twitter at least, as long as the DMCA elephant in the room remains undealt with. And I'm not the only one complaining about that. Poke around on Twitter. And turn on the responses that Twitter hides, and you'll see even more of that. Look at the CEO tweets, look at the tweets from the support staff, look at everything these, these companies are saying publicly. They can't say anything, Twitch can't say anything without people showing up. What about DMCA? What about DMCA? What about DMCA? So, you know, am I some kind of condescending snob because YouTube objectively has something better that should be expanded so that more, more folks besides record companies can apply policies besides takedowns only? It's just saying things, it's just telling you the way it is. If Twitch does something good, we'll say it as such. If Twitch does something bad, we'll say it as such. If YouTube does something good, we'll say it as such. If YouTube does something bad, we'll say it as such. Facebook too. Let me, let me just rattle off a good and bad thing about every single one of these platforms. Twitch, good. The banning system. You can't harass someone with sock puppet accounts on Twitch because getting banned IP shadow bans you. So you scream into the void on any sock puppet accounts you create. Twitch bad. DMCA. They have no plan for DMCA, whereas Facebook got a, went out and got a music license for Facebook gaming streamers. And YouTube has content ID, so the record labels have an alternative through the platform to having to drag DMCA into everything. Most of the DMCA that I hear on YouTube these days is individuals abusing the system to silence criticism of other YouTubers. That is the majority of the times I hear about DMCA on YouTube. So my, uh, my suggestion for YouTube, expand it so that people can block, mute, et cetera, monetize or track as individuals, not needing to, you know, not having to be like folks in the content ID system or something and tie that into the copyright sensor that creators have through Creator Studio. So I can see, for example, when someone re-uploads one of my videos onto their own channel, because they're one of those channels that just takes everyone else's videos, whoop de doo You know, it's it's pushes me in the algorithm a little. I would love to see them add an option for 50-50 split. So an automatic monetize 50-50. So they get half the revenue and I get half the revenue because they hosted my video. And then I won't give a darn in the world. I won't give a darn unless they're doing something malicious like linking to malware or something. So YouTube has the tools. They just got to put two and two together. All right, so that's Twitch good and bad. Let's talk about YouTube good, YouTube bad. YouTube good, content ID system. They spent the money and invested and developed a system with the technology so that record labels don't have to do to YouTube what they're doing to Twitch. They can automate the process, submit all their stuff, and decide what, what should the system do if it detects a match. The end, YouTube gets to handle it independent of the DMCA because no takedown was, actually gets issued. 
YouTube, bad. An example of something I absolutely do not like about YouTube is one of their longest running problems, an over-reliance on automated systems. The technology that those automated systems represent as a work in progress is a really good thing. But these experiments with technology have false positives and creators wanting to amount to something on the platform should not have to worry about losing their channel because of false positives or even evaluations that look like they're done by computer systems instead of by people, like some of the stuff I see under uh, at Team YouTube on Twitter. When people are complaining about how their review for monetization got rejected and they're like, I know what's in my video. It does not have extreme profanity in the first 60 seconds because all that plays is instrumental music. What's going on, YouTube? Why are you so incompetent? So there's YouTube good and bad. Facebook good and bad. Facebook is probably YouTube's most aggressive competitor on the good side. Much of what they have is basically what YouTube has, just not as refined. But, it, but they serve as an example of that these major platforms can have this stuff without having to be another Google. So they're working on it, and the zeal behind the teams that are making Facebook gaming into something is probably unmatched in the industry. The bad is the real names thing, and the unfortunate reality that Facebook's base product, Facebook itself, is based on a social media model that doesn't play as nicely in this day and age of people having personas and personalities online instead of putting their real names everywhere they go. The real names thing, I think, is a showstopper for Facebook gaming. They are not a viable Twitch competitor or, or YouTube competitor until they figure something out for this. They've made some steps in the right direction, some steps in the wrong direction, every time I've tuned into a, to a, to a Facebook stream just to see how they're doing. So that's what they need. They need to fix that. Uh, and that will, of course, make them a stronger competitor than Twitch when it comes to live streaming. But as long as they don't join the exclusivity crowd with Twitch, we'll have Facebook and YouTube as very strong competition and a very good alternative for people that are curious about double streaming, multi-streaming, but oops, they're a Twitch affiliate, so they just don't bother with Twitch, which is the worst platform for growth anyways because of weak technology. So there you go. We've done goods and bads in all three of them. We need to get out of this mindset, this divide and conquer mindset that one platform being good automatically means the other platforms bad or vice versa. Just, I cannot believe the kind of hatred that I've received. People mass abandoning the channel, unsubbing, da 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 da, just because I decided to experiment with Twitch streaming. Oh, some of the content you made was crap. Of course it was, I was new to it. Some of my very first YouTube videos were like that as well. You're always crap when you start. You gotta figure things out but you never figure things out if you never give it a shot. Enough. So what did I start with? I started with gaming streaming. I started out, well, you know, let's get some ideas from some, some successful creators instead of starting from scratch, trying to figure it all out. So I did. Went in with game streaming. Then I, was like, then I was like, you know what? Let's see what the commentaries that I do taken live would look like. The radio style summer happened. And to not leave the YouTube people completely in the dark, I sent, I used the very robust highlight feature to send the clips back over to YouTube. Clips, highlights, etc. No VODs for the most part, because that wouldn't make too much sense, because most of what I was doing was topical. If I had a show with two topics, I wanted two videos on YouTube, not one. Because I didn't want people having to skip half the video if they were interested in one topic or another. And at the same time, YouTube, the YouTube meta right now for videos has a little too much fluff in it. There are too many redundant elements in videos. In video advertising, the way videos start and end these days, end screens are cool because it's supported by the UI, but bothering people to sub to all your social medias all the time, you know, or make sure you like this video every single time. Likes should be because people like something, not because you told them to do it. That's why they're called likes. So, just one of the ways in which YouTube systems have credibility problems. All this engagement, as it's called, you know, I, I have yet to, I don't see them being consistently used for the right reasons. There's people that want to mess with people that just dislike all their stuff just for the heck of it. Doesn't mean they actually dislike the video. They're just like, ah, oh, watch this, <laughs> dislike. Then there's people that are liking videos only because the creator told them to. So, but even still, 
you don't see a situation where the likes equal the amount of views or come close to it. It's still the case that the majority of people watching YouTube videos are just watching, which is perfectly fine. They're letting the ads play and whatnot, not using an ad blocker. They're supporting the creator and the platform. It's that simple. You can't be go twisting people's arms and legs and saying they're bad people because they won't do what you want them to do in that case. So it's like, it's like, let's say someone subscribes to you and they never watch any of your videos ever again. You're like, well, I don't want a fake subscriber. How dare they? Why'd they even subscribe? They're not watching any of my stuff. What'd they subscribe for? Well, whoopsie doopsie, you don't know that they died in a car accident the day after they subscribed to you. Oops. You self-centered, entitled piece of crap as a content creator. Yeah, you can't be assuming things about your audience, because unless your audience tells you, and even then, and it, then if they're not lying, you don't know what they're going through, you know? Could be the case. Doesn't have to be that wild either. Someone subs to you. Oh, look, their house got hit by a tor. Oh, look, the head end, not their house. Their he the head end of their internet got hit by a tornado. Their ISP isn't going to have their internet back online for at least a week. You don't get any views. That person was a fake subscriber. No, they had a natural disaster that took down their internet service. So, look, when it comes to additional platforms, I've been doing that for years. I checked out livevideo.com when it was still a thing. Bounced between YouTube and live video. Had the same questions I have now. What should I put where? Live video went out of business. I decided I wasn't going to make that mistake again, so I went to Wikipedia and looked up who had the most video traffic, who really was the number two video service in the world behind YouTube for my next alternative to YouTube. The second most, um, second biggest YouTube, uh, bi biggest platform in the world was the YouTube of China, uh, with the official blessing of the Chinese government, so... <laughs> But aside from that, aside from that, in terms of, you know, it's it's not, you know, the res propped up by government censorship, the next biggest platform was Daily Motion. But even then, you're talking about a decimal point difference. 50 views on YouTube is the equivalent of five views on Daily Motion, or it was back then. Daily Motion is a lot more commercial now since it was bought out by Vivendi. So Today, it exists largely as a warning of what will happen to YouTube if they forget about the end, the individual creators. If they go all corporate, they become like Daily Motion, because that's exactly the direction that Daily Motion went in. They walled off the UGC, user generated content, aka anything that you and I could create, and they promote CNN, MSNBC, Vanity Fair, da da da, stuff from organizations, because it's the website for videos that matter. That's the daily motion of 2020. And so I go over there every so often and I see stuff being featured on the front page with only 5,000 views. This is the stuff that's getting paraded about on the front page of the, of the platform these days. And I'm like, will anything I upload on there ever get any views ever again? <laughs> so, yeah, it's just the sort of thing where, <sighs> but it's still viable. It's still a platform that's there at the very least. So it's not like live video that actually went out of business. Now, Twitch, to some people, is an a completely viable alternative to YouTube. I'm sure DMCA has rattled that a lot. But I've run into the people who will not give YouTube a chance because of Twitch. And I did not first get involved in Twitch on Twitch in 2020. I made a collection over there to make sure that this is documented for anybody who wants to actually know what they're talking about to see twitch.tv slash multimedia J. So in the mid 2010s, before I had the internet to stream with Twitch decided to go in YouTube's direction and they opened up uploads to everybody, not just Twitch affiliates and partners. So I tried it. I didn't stream, I just uploaded videos and I sent my gaming videos over there. And some of them got some decent views for the first month or two of the program before the uploads directory was hidden behind too many clicks, which it was the whole time, but people checked it out because it was new. But what killed my interest in Twitch for uploads 
was finding out that the algorithms completely stop doing anything for your video when it's more than X amount of days old. So most of the views that my videos have gotten on Twitch were from the very beginning of this experiment when it was new and everybody was checking out uploads on Twitch instead of just streams all the time. 2016. So that's when I started on Twitch, though. My video, Howdy Twitch, has 100 plus views, mo probably most of them from 2016, because the algorithms are not built for anything evergreen. The platform itself does not support evergreen content very well at all. People have to know to dig for it. They will not get recommended it. So in a sense, other than streaming, when it comes to where you're going to do stuff, Twitch is pretty much daily motion. It's not purple YouTube. Twitch needs to design their platform to support evergreen content in order to compete with not just YouTube, but Facebook, because Facebook has an evergreen content feature as well through Facebook video. And there's actually an infamous issue where people are taking YouTube videos and re-uploading them to Facebook which is basically him taking content from one platform and uploading it to another behind the creator's back. There's been problems with that for years on Facebook, but the reason why it's viable and people are doing it is because Facebook is building a video presence and a live presence. There is Facebook video and there's also Facebook live, the non gaming answer to what now Facebook gaming is nowadays for streaming. So they have rather split environments, and all of this is complicated by Facebook being a descendant of MySpace. So going back to the e-shrine days of social media, when your social media was basically your real name on something similar to a personal website that really wasn't meant to go very far besides people that knew you in real life. Not like, say, YouTube or Twitch, where you have a persona, a username, and you build something up. And some people are even foolish enough to call it building a brand, when in reality you're just a personality. That's why I say persona instead of personal brand, because persona means the part of your personality that others get to see. And really, for everybody who's not acting out a fictional character, but is somewhere between a fictional character and who they are in real life, this is exactly the word to use to describe what, what this is all about. Plus, it retains the human side of this as well, in terms of the creators giving a darn about their audience, and the audience giving a darn about the creators they watch. This marketing corporate stuff that you'll hear from a lot of other commentators does not do that. So Facebook has some very serious potential. It's just a little too split up and it has some systemic issues it needs to resolve with its roots basically in the same generation of social media as MySpace. It does not jive well in 2020. It will not jive well with building a persona and even multi-streamers like Megan Yeah that I follow are not streaming on Facebook gaming as one of their platforms. And the only reason I know any decent sized Facebook gaming streamers is because of collabs at people on the platforms I do watch, like Disguised Toast. Facebook had to get them to sign exclusivity deals of some sort to even get them to be a big name on Facebook gaming. And I think really that's part of the brain drain problems that Facebook gaming is going to have. More people fi the more people that figure out the systemic issues with Facebook in its current form, the more they're going to want to go somewhere else like YouTube or Twitch, probably YouTube. But that's the thing, you know, competition is good. You can't hate somebody for getting involved in other platforms. And quite frankly, YouTube is as much as it's about anything related to metrics, views, whatever, watch time. It's also about self-expression because there is an art side to what it is that we do here. So you think about what would make you happy as a creator? What kind of stuff do you think should exist that you think people will like and enjoy? That's your YouTube channel in a nutshell. You're working on stuff that you want to make. And people will appreciate. You can go out of your way to try and find, you know, other people, what people want and make something that they'll like and enjoy. That's cool and all, but fundamentally, if you're not happy with what it is that you're doing, it's just going to turn into a grind, a job, what have you. It's just the way it's going to be. So YouTube versus Twitch competition is good. I've about had it with all of these people that have just given me such a hard time about all of this, including the people that are pretending that I've stopped making videos. Oh, I hope you're okay, Jay. Just because I'm not doing the same old stuff over and over again. Look, 
the future is an environment where you have to know your way around multiple platforms and not look stupid because you've spent all your time on just one of them. Just this past week, I had an argument with a Twitch affiliate who fell right into the mold of overly emotional Twitch streamer who doesn't want to acknowledge that their that their platform has deficiencies. So that I go, I check the numbers. They're a Twitch affiliate, single digit concurrence after streaming on Twitch for two years. But they get upset with me because I bring up that platforms need to support their creators. And I know this from experience. YouTube. YouTube needs to be the place where a nobody can become a somebody. Because if the users stop mattering, they become a daily motion. That's the direction daily motion took. The statistics that made me choose daily motion as my second video platform many years ago were based on many years ago before all of this emphasis on all this commercial stuff. So who knows how low their numbers have gotten since then, how much of a small niche platform based in the EU they've become. So, but that's it. I mean, if that was going to look, and the thing is there's been attempts at corporate YouTube clones previously, and there've been attempts to take would be YouTube competitors and kick out all the little guys and only focus on the biggest creators like blip and blip went out of business. The only thing that has consistently worked. I mean, there, there are also YouTube competitors that can't even get the business model, right? Like Vimeo, who still has plans based on the bandwidth your videos take up. That your visibility is limited by how much you can pay for the bandwidth of the hosting, whereas YouTube runs like a media organization with advertising. So YouTube has worked. You have to ask yourself, why has YouTube worked? And the answer to that is that YouTube has worked because it's somewhere the you broadcast yourself. It's an environment where a nobody can become a somebody. And because of this, the promise of this or the prospect of this is what makes people want to do stuff on YouTube, at least before all these Twitch people stop dumping all their VODs on here because of, because of worries about DMCA. But the roots of YouTube are with the YouTubers themselves, individuals now called creators. The idea that a nobody can become a somebody is what attracts you to a platform, and you have to feel like that's doable. Otherwise, you end up like Twitch, where you have all these creators now who are making YouTube channels they don't care about because the only reason they have it is because they couldn't grow on Twitch. And someone told them, yeah, make YouTube videos. That's what happens when you don't have this. It is 100% incumbent upon a platform that people feel like they can amount to something because that's what helps the image of the platform. If you don't have that, you don't have a viable platform for this kind of stuff. You might as well. And what happens when your talent doesn't want to make good stuff anymore because they're too intimidated or don't feel like it's going to be worth it? What happens? What you have available to watch gets boring as people go through the stuff that was better from the better days what you have available to watch gets boring. The talent gets less interesting. The content gets less interesting. The UGC, as it's called on Daily Motion, withers away, and you become the next Daily Motion because all that's left is movie rentals, trailers, commercial content, which is exactly what Daily Motion has focused on after the Vivendi takeover. It's in the news. Go look for it. I've certainly posted plenty of times about this whole thing and talked about it plenty of times, but the articles are out there. The vision that Vivendi's executives had for Daily Motion when they acquired them was not for UGC to continue being what it was. It was to focus on commercial partners. And the way the platform is nowadays reflects that. And the numbers they're getting reflect that as well. 
So when you've ground away on Twitch and you've gotten nowhere in two years, then you attack the person in some way who is saying that Twitch isn't doing enough for its creators or imply that, oh, you think Twitch should do everything for you? Really bad, really bad idea, by the way. When you decide to do something like that, I'm going to check out and see if you have any credibility. So I went and looked and, oh, look, there you go. <laughs> Some of the angriest people I've seen on Twitter in the desperation groups for Twitch streamers. And don't forget all the, some of those people, they've been burned by this, but some of them just don't want to admit it. They don't want to admit the platform has deficiencies and the platform is not as competitive. It's just really good at selling itself. And that's why it's so huge. Like I said, this got ridiculous a long time ago. Just people can't get over themselves enough to admit it. So, that doesn't mean it's all over for Twitch. Most of their problems could be solved by them actually figuring out what their plan is going to be to get away from strikes only for DMCA. Because otherwise, they, they continue being stuck where they are. Their, de- their number one deficiency is their overemphasis on live content, their overemphasis on concurrent views, and all well, actually their emphasis at all on concurrence, and all the problems that brings. So I'm not streaming on Twitch tonight. The reason being is I got to three concurrence last night, but I'm waiting to see if the system is ever going to give me any credit for it. Because the number before... Before I started streaming last night, and it was a good stream at three plus concurrence on average, the number that I was looking at last night, browser, was 297, and now it's still 297. Now, I want to see if this is some kind of rounding issue where they won't give me credit because it rounds to three instead of actually is being three, but let's look at the, look, let's look at the analytics here. Here you go, 30 days, three. There it is. Why didn't this light up in the email? Why didn't this light up in the stream email? There it is. So here's what I think is going to happen. I think that I'm not going to get affiliate because after the seventh, this drops off and takes the average back down below three. Because before I learned this lesson, I was actually still streaming on Twitch when it wasn't going to get me three viewers. See the problem with concurrence? I have no motivation to do anything on Twitch except for a small amount of content that I know gets people to tune in so i can't learn anything new i can't really develop a streaming presence i can't develop streaming skills unless it's a sure thing unless i want to be stuck like these people that talk about taking years to just to get twitch affiliates because they're just grinding away on twitch too much this is the unintended consequences here this is all unintended consequences Let's see here. So this is after the election. A lot of people liked this. They tuned in. I was doing political commentary on Joe Biden getting elected. Then I did something that was just there for the heck of it. Then I did a, then a 2.5, then a 2, 2.8, then some threes. So right around the time I started getting above three was when I started playing underrepresented games on Twitch that are games that people might know about, like some of the older Mario Kart games that people don't play on Twitch and some other Super Nintendo and other such games, too. And I may be thinking, and I even got some controllers too. Here's a new Hyperkin Scout controller. Here's my new Hyperkin Scout controller that just came in for Super Nintendo to complement the old USB one that I picked up a year or two ago for Shovel Knight. Yeah, it's a bit plainer design, but it feels better. The last Hyperkin Scout controller I got was a little too soft. So I think this will be good for like Mario Kart Super Circuit or something. That's a game I actually never even played before. And I can tell you that Long term, I think Nintendo is going to be a huge focus of my Twitch channel because Nintendo games don't have licensed soundtracks. You can play Mario, Zelda, Mario Kart, etc. Maybe get involved in some Smash Brothers, get a Switch, things like that. Because right now, with with Twitch's infamous problems with DMCA right now, nobody re- it's not really worth it to play a game with any kind of licensed soundtrack. So games with like Mario and Zelda. Stick to Nintendo. Did I just turn on the... Oh, no, no, no. I might have forgotten to turn off the Wii U. I was testing the controller earlier. But there you go. I think Nintendo is going to be a very big focus in my Twitch channel long term because there's an... On, as we know, over here on YouTube, 
there is the ongoing history of Nintendo not really doing the right thing on YouTube. They made fun of Sega a while back when Sega of Japan, what, what, or someone representing them, went on that dmca spree for Shining Force. At the same time, when Super Mario Maker came out, they did the exact same thing with people hosting ROM hack videos. Giant dmca spree. They technically could do that because it was pirated software, but it was a little hypocritical for them to do that. So I think really Nintendo, but nowadays, you know, Nintendo on, on Twitch and things like that, you're talking Mario games, Zelda games, classic Nintendo franchises. You're talking games that I can relate to on, in, on the NES and the SNES. Maybe I could try speed running or something. Probably the best way to focus a channel would be on Nintendo stuff. In terms of getting a Switch, Mr. Logan, <laughs> the next hardware revision of the Switch, if, if Nintendo makes this 4K Switch, that'll be the Switch that I get. Because the biggest thing that I, that I had a problem with was having a Nintendo box, yet another Nintendo box, that is underpowered. I have a Wii U, which still has the virtual console and functioning online services for the Nintendo eShop and stuff because it shares it with a 3DS. So that's got some staying power by itself, even though I bought the thing way back in 2012. So it's in near mint condition, too, because I've always been afraid of breaking the gamepad controller. So I've traditionally used a uh, Wii U Pro controller for most of the games. But if the Switch is a big step forward from the Wii U because it does 4K 30 and 1080 60, like some of the consoles that are coming out right now, when that comes out, that's my Switch. $300, $400, $500, who cares? I'll save up the money and get one. And I'll be a big Nintendo streamer over on Twitch. Even if it means playing underrepresented games so that my stuff will show up in the directories for live and VOD. And so people can find me because I'm not the umpteenth person playing whatever the popular Nintendo game is now. So that, that's part of it, too. MMOs are also pretty decent because they have because MMOs also have soundtracks that aren't licensed. They're not copyrighted music. So just, well, they are all music is copyrighted. We're talking commercial music here. So World of Warcraft, Elder Scrolls Online, Final Fantasy. So MMOs are good are good for Twitch as well. And then the rest of the games that maybe you need we might need content ID to not get strikes can stream on YouTube. So there is some concentrated coolness for my Twitch channel after affiliate gets unlocked. Just want to get that out of the way. I have no plans for Twitch partner. Don't want to even think about it. And quite frankly, Twitch would have to give me a really good deal on the contract for me to ever become a Twitch partner because I know that they're exclusively focused on exclusivity compared to the other platforms. And they limit their creators more than any other platform because of this stuff. The other way in which they limit their creators is specifically because of these concurrent goals. I was reading on Reddit last night about other people that were wondering, why haven't I gotten an affiliate yet, even though I have three concurrents? And one of them said, yeah, the concurrent thing stops people the most. Of course it does. Number one, you have to understand live streaming, the limitations of live streaming, including being tied to time slots. People have to be able to watch you right then. And then you talk about Twitch, which has such a huge focus on live that that's almost all that matters on there. There's really no evergreen support, and that's a, that's a deficiency that Twitch needs to improve in order to be competitive with YouTube and Facebook, because both YouTube and Facebook have the capability. YouTube and Facebook have the capability for or reasons to be there besides when somebody's live. Twitch, though, keeps digging themselves a bigger and bigger hole because of their overemphasis on the live side of it. Really, they should continue what they did in the mid-2010s. They should try and, number one, fix their search problems and their underlying tech problems and have a reason to go to Twitch for gaming-related stuff that's after the fact. Might be a big undertaking for a company Twitch's size because they're a lot smaller than YouTube in terms of hits per day and the kind of numbers they throw around. So there's also the differences in the sizes of the platform's to consider as well. But this is the thing. I mean, Twitch has a very strong brand. They're very strongly associated with gaming. And I'm telling you right now, if they address their DMCA problem, they put themselves back into contention. 
they can go back to being the wimpy platform that doesn't promote you instead of the platform that's going to throw you under the bus because they had no they got caught with their pants down so to speak with no plan for DMCA for so long the RIAA found ROI found it worth investing in automated systems to crawl for violations so now Instead of some crappy Twitch system being the reason why your streams get pulled down, someone else's crappy system becomes the reason why you get strikes under federal law, and in order to maintain safe harbor, Twitch has to deal with those. This is also a mandate for YouTube. Expand Content ID and the ability to resolve issues through the platform's features, like the copyright tab, for creators on Creator Studio. So if someone like me can see someone took some of my content on their YouTube video and my options are not just DMCA. So that's the thing. I want more options. In most cases, I would do the 50-50 revenue split. So they could monetize my video and half of it gets redirected to the channel because I made the content and they have it on theirs. They don't have that option yet. They have like monetize everything. And I would also support if they went proportionate with it. So if they only used my stuff for 10% of their video, it's 10% of the revenue. Or 5% even if we want to do 50-50 split. So, but that's, that's the thing. YouTube's content ID system is an alternative to DMCA. And from a business perspective like the music companies, it's a better alternative than chasing strikes all over the place. Because every single individual strike is potentially starting a legal dispute between the business and the end user. If they strike the wrong person, it gets expensive in legal fees. If they actually want to fight back, take it to court and stuff like that. So, but the thing is, YouTube invested, they've got the system, Twitch doesn't. How does Twitch take care of this issue? And when they do, they're back in contention. They're just back to being the underdog platform that has too much live, not enough everything else. It's not like it's the end of Twitch because of this. It's the end of Twitch if they don't do something about it and their platform withers away because more people wake up to this and YouTube and Facebook keep getting stronger to the point where Amazon's like, we're done. They get spun off. And then who owns them? So, and don't forget... If you want to do stuff on these platforms that each platform is the best at, there are some things Twitch does better than YouTube. One of them is, number one, if you're just doing la la, let's hang out and play video games, and you don't want to have to go keep deleting stuff, if you want stuff that, if you don't mind content actually expiring because it's old and it's not special, you didn't make highlights of it, you don't care, Twitch will do all that for you with the expiration on, on stuff of past broadcasts. Also, the marry up content. They experimented with it with Twitch soundtrack, but the big one is Amazon watch parties. If Amazon spins off Twitch, that's over. And that takes away one of the things you can do on Twitch, a watch party that you couldn't do on YouTube, unless YouTube makes similar technology. That's one of the things, the same thing, this is another thing too that people are bringing up. Amazon, parent company of Twitch, why don't they try and look into something similar to what they already do with Amazon Music for their music selling service and stuff like that. That's another thing, too. But there's licensing and costs involved and things like that. But the thing is, as Zach Bussey put on his Twitter last week, there are some really nasty op-eds being written in, on, like, Billboard.com and stuff, talking about how Twitch just hasn't done enough to properly respect the music industry. Meanwhile, other platforms, even platforms like Instagram and TikTok, have done more. So I never thought I'd agree, like I said earlier, I never thought I'd agree with somebody in the music industry over this, but I'm actually cheering on a CEO of a rights holder organization similar to the RIAA. I never thought I'd see the day I'd be doing that, but it is something that Twitch needs to solve. Otherwise, why are they still around? You know, they are doomed content-wise if they don't fix this. But just because... They have a showstopper issue doesn't mean that creators like myself shouldn't look at Twitch and see how can we still have a presence there, even if it's limited. That's the big thing that matters with this Twitch thing. Because I know there are YouTubers who are terrible at streaming. They don't have any idea how to stream. They can't even do what I'm doing. 
sound like a radio host half the time. They absolutely can't get this down. And some of it, I think, is their own denial of what live streaming has become. Live streaming is here, and it's here to stay. The question is, we're not going back to the olden days where YouTube videos were all you ever needed. Live streaming is here, it is here to stay, and there are things that live streams do that they do better than videos. Just You just have to play the formats to their strengths and don't, you know, have streams do what they should do, have videos do what they should do. And this is what I've been spending 2020 figuring out. So the people that want to be angry at me because I actually gave Twitch a chance and gave streaming a chance, sorry. It would take, you know, if I listened to some of these commentators, I would be in a very different place right now, and it wouldn't be a better one. I'd be like some of these people that are quitting the Twitch affiliate program because of something somebody else said. And then they're making YouTube videos bragging about it, repeating these points, telling me they didn't think about what they were told. They just repeated it, and they repeated the commentator that they were repeating mistakes. So, come on now. <laughs> it's just... That's what this has been about in 2020. Not that I was going to totally walk away from tech videos. I just want the tech videos as people problems to be solved. Part of that is those of you who watch my tech videos or anyone else's tech videos, take a good hard look in the mirror at the way you treat others online. Because much of the same clanging brass pick apart criticism that I've seen in the comments on my own tech videos, I've seen on some pretty big channels like Paul's Hardware, Jay's Two Cents, you name it. And I've seen some some of these creators go on Twitter upset about what people are saying in their YouTube comments because it's just it's taking away the fun of making videos about computers, just the way people are, are treating them. It's the look, you're a person. I'm a person. This is interaction between people. It's just being done through the Internet, but there's still a person on the other side. This person side of things is what built YouTube. People, it may be parasocial relationships, but it's still a it's still a relationship between you, two human beings. You may really like that YouTuber or streamer. They may not know you from the man in the moon, because they, you know, you you never you never really followed up they on you know who are you when you're not streaming or whatever. Do you have any other social media presences or something? Now they may not know you from the man in the moon, but it's still human beings interacting with each other. When you like someone's YouTube video, human beings interacting with each other. So I can tell you right now, if the ad blocker problem with the tech videos, which still persists to this day, was fixed, and the people problem with the tech videos that persists to this day was fixed, not only would I be more interested in doing more of those, but the YouTube algorithms would be promoting them more. As it stands, appliance videos smoke everything when I can stay away from tech videos long enough so that the tech crowd isn't watching everything I upload anymore so I can make a video about a home appliance and it won't get ad blocked to death. Like the one about the Sunbeam Hotshot did. So it took a while for the demographics to change. But it's not just about the washer and dryer video anymore as YouTube endlessly passes them around. That's the power of the algorithms when they're ad friendly and ad dollar friendly. And so here I am, Multimedia J, but my most popular videos make me look like the Maytag repairman. Congratulations! But then I look at the numbers, and even though there are higher CPMs on the tech videos, because tech stuff can sell stuff, brings in less revenue. YouTube's robots blow it off more. Besides Win8 versus the Delosaurus, next closest tech video is only at 30,000 views. Recently, after... Recently, and its content, I forgot it was from 2019, but its content resembles some stuff I did when I was tinkering with speakers in 2016, 2017. I've had a single electronics video start to rise in the ranking and start to get treated better in terms of not being ad blocked. So one tech video in five, in see 2013, in seven years, of the wacky world of multimedia J. One tech video is now being treated nicely by the algorithm because the, the problems related to tech videos don't show up on that one. And they, or they've stopped. 
The ratio, the ad block ratio is way better. It's closer to 100%. It's not like, say, this Forza video that's gone viral that's like a third. So I know it's going to die very hard when it stops getting passed around because YouTube's not making any money off of it. That's the platform, though. That's YouTube's business model. And if the algorithms do not help people's content go around and get viewed by people, if the algorithms don't help you out, the only choice you have to have any decent viewership is to bug the living crap out of your audience to pass your video around because the systems won't help you. Now, who would like that? For me to join these, these groups of YouTubers that are bugging you every single video. Make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, make sure you ring the bell, and make sure to share my videos on social media. Would you like to see that every single video? I don't think so. I hate seeing it every single video. There, It's gotten so bad on here that there are certain creators that I know for a fact when I'm about two thirds to 75% through the video, I can stop watching and deny them watch hours because I know the rest of the video is going to be fluff. They have in-video advertising towards the end. Hey, let's check. Don't forget our sponsor. And then they have the calls to action and then they have an end screen, which I'm never going to see because they undercut all that stuff with the in-video advertising. The biggest thing I do not like is in-video advertising because YouTube is made for the long run. What if, say, Ridge Wallet has some big scandal? They go out of business and they're known for years as Ha Ha Ridge Wallet. They failed. And they're just a stain on anywhere they show up on online media. But all your YouTube videos from 2020 had in-video advertising for Ridge Wallet. That's the kind of scenario. I hope it doesn't have an original. I'm just thinking of an example here, but that's the kind of situation that we got to be concerned about with this in video advertising. And you know what? It's already happening. I saw some review tech USA videos pop through my algorithm, not uh, my homepage a while back. I think this is before I show, I said to the system, don't show me his stuff anymore, but I could always resub to get back into that. But I saw some videos and people in the comments, these were like really old Review Tech USA videos, and people in the comments were laughing about his in-video pre-roll that he did before he started his video because something something scandalous happened to the company sometime in the last several years. Can't remember which one it was, but that's the thing. So again, you know, YouTube has shown consistently for years, money is what matters to them. So that's that's the thing with the tech videos. But at the same time, you got to know where to put stuff. And that's why I'm looking at Twitch, specifically for gaming now. And even among gaming, stuff that will not inherently be vulnerable to Twitch's current weakness with DMCA. So no games with licensed soundtracks in case something accidentally plays. It's not that I don't know how to turn off the music in Grand Theft Auto. But if you play Grand Theft Auto Vice City... The opening cutscene has a muffled, sounds like a radio in the room, version of Broken Wings. That's what I'd be worried about the RIAA's robots doing false positives of. Not that I couldn't turn the music off in-game, but if there's a cutscene that has you know, music like that, it also happens in Forza Horizon, by the way. You can turn the radio completely off in Forza, but you have to turn something else down in order for the stuff that's playing through the PA at the Forza Festival to not potentially be matchable. So it's the other, it's the, like the snippets of songs that are put into the game in a very altered form that maybe even could be considered fair use. If the company were sued, but not individuals streaming it. You know, Rockstar... Maybe they have something that they could successfully argue is fair use. But what if the RAAA's robots picked it up from your Twitch stream? That's the part to be concerned about. So until Twitch gets their stuff together, my involvement on the platform is limited. Only certain kinds of games and only stuff that I know won't be vulnerable to Twitch's current vulnerabilities as a platform. So for those of you that may have thought I joined the exodus of all these disgruntled YouTubers that have gone over to Twitch, become Twitch affiliates, gotten some subs and donos, and never looked back, that will not happen. YouTube has just proven itself 
to be the more mature, more developed, and more sophisticated platform. It's just a matter of what to do where. And in the case of 2020, with all the streaming, figuring out by learning this stuff, what streaming is good at, what streaming is not good at, what I should still make videos about. So when the dust settles from all this, there'll be a lot of stuff in a lot of places. There'll be a lot of stuff in a lot of places, and it'll be quite a variety, which given the big tent that is multimedia. A guy going by the name Multimedia J, you'd probably have to wonder if something was wrong with me if I didn't do something like that. <laughs> so, all right, so here's what we're going to do. Because of this problem with the affiliate thing, we're going to see if Twitch does what I think they're going to do. So I'm not going to touch Twitch for a while. The three concurrent viewers are there for affiliate. But my guess is they don't give me credit for it for whatever reason. And then the election stream drops off and it goes back below three. And then we're back to square one. And we basically have to brute force the whole setup, you know, by going a month, having a month where I do just enough with just enough concurrence to get it. But again, this is their concurrent requirements severely affecting what I do on that platform and when. And it's all, I mean, imagine if I wanted to get partnered. This would be even bigger because you need to get to 75 concurrence in order to get partnered on Twitch. So now things get even more frustrating. And this is the frustrations I'm hearing about with all these people making YouTube videos about how they left the affiliate program and they're going to multi-stream now or they've left Twitch altogether because they're done with the nonsense. I know what powers the nonsense, though. I follow the business news. I follow the numbers. I follow. I know a few things about marketing. So I follow what the commentators are saying as well, whether or not it's true. And quite frankly, I know with lots of documentation why people are having the bad time that they're having on Twitch. And I'm no exception either. And I, I'll tell you what, it's not just the little people that are not growing on Twitch. I can guess for you the concurrence of several streamers I watch on a regular basis, even without paying attention to it, because they're not growing either. So unless there's something like the Among Us thing, where Among Us, with the drama that's involved in that game, is ballooning the living daylights out of the people that play it more often, to the point where I wonder if these people ever get sick of playing Among Us, but they're never going to stop playing because it's so successful for them right now. That would be a problem as well. How are these people going to fight off the coming burnout from playing Among Us too much? Because it's literally what they've been doing for months since the summer when the game took off. Among Us wildcards aside, though, anybody who's not riding the wave of that fad is pretty much, no matter what games they play, around a certain amount of concurrence that I already associate with them. Whether it's 100, 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 25,000, there really isn't growth on Twitch for anybody. So it's not just the little guys. It's just that people are upset because, you know, people are upset because they can't amount to anything, even after years of streaming. That's what I keep hearing from these Twitch people as well that are making YouTube videos about leaving the platform. Yeah, you know, I streamed and whatnot, and I made the emotes, I got Twitch affiliate, but then I didn't grow. Yeah, well, guess what? There's partners that have dwindled down to affiliate level concurrence as well. That's why Twitch had that booster program for them a while back. And they're trying to find ways to support creators. But the thing is, the big thing is DMCA. There is no better thing that Twitch could do to support its creators than to have a plan for DMCA besides strikes only. Like what YouTube and Facebook have done. As long as that's unresolved, nothing they ever do matters. It's just going to be cutesy little things, but people are going to keep rip-roaring in every single tweet that they post. What about DMCA? What about DMCA? What about DMCA? What about DMCA? Getting sick of it yet? Well, I hope the Twitch people don't get sick of it anytime soon, because until that is solved, that's what's going to keep happening when they tweet. Mm. Never seen such a gaping weakness in a social media platform as I've seen with, t with Twitch DMCA Mageddon. You know, you got people dancing to nothing. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, just load this song up in your iPad and three, two, one, play. I'm going to start dancing, you know, and it's going to be DMCA free. It's this is so stupid. It's so stupid. Yeah. And then the latest thing. 
playing the music at line level, super, super low, like this. You can hear it if you turn on the loudness equalization in your audio control panel on your computer and it does dynamic range compression to make all music the same volume. That's, by the way, one of the ways to get around volume problems on YouTube videos for people recording at different levels. But the RIAA, if they want to snoop that for violations, just has to put in a compressor to their setup and have it listen to the compressed audio and match it against the sample. So it, it, it just, it, this is so, this is absolutely ridiculous with them. And that's why I keep bringing it up. And it's not just me anymore. It's other people that are bringing this up a lot too. This got ridiculous so long ago. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> this got ridiculous so long ago. And to see Twitch come out with all these ideas since then, multiplayer ads, let's see, multiplayer ads, the booster program for smaller channels so that they can basically uh, raise through channel points. They can get into that sponsored spot on the front page. Site redesigns, bringing back those category buttons for games, IRL, etc. the big purple buttons that are on there now. And the latest is the going live shelf, which is a pursuit of feature parody with YouTube because of the whole thing with starting soon screens. Starting soon screens are a total disaster for IT. They're perfectly accepted in the world of streaming and they serve a purpose. But from a tech perspective, they're a nightmare. Think about it. 10 minutes of music, if not more, in a start soon screen replicated for every single stream replay or VOD, if you're from Twitch, every single stream replay that's being stored on their systems times every single streamer that's doing this. So I, I think the technical solution, and I should do this on YouTube as well, poo poo on me for not doing this tonight actually schedule your stream a half hour before you start give it some time for the notification to go out people can you know go to the page and then have like a really short start soon screen my start soon screens are going to be more like intros so they're going to play a single song and those songs are going to get shorter like maybe a two minute song even so barely a start soon screen so the point of this is there's a technical alternative that uses less space. Facebook was the first platform to officially discourage the use of start soon screens. And I think YouTube will follow suit very shortly and Twitch can't be left out in the cold either. So they're new. Here's the thing. The alternative to a start soon screen and YouTube actually rolled out some features. There's a creator insider video that I wrote a really nice comment to because I love all these ideas. One of the ideas that YouTube's going to be working on for 2021 is for premieres or is for premieres before they start, there'll be some kind of video playing, maybe something you can loop or something, some kind of hype video. I would love to see that technology adapted to replace start soon screens. So you upload one loopable intro for start soon and you can tack that onto all your streams, but that piece of video only exists once when you upload it, not on every single stream you make. And it cuts down on the storage that's required to host all your stuff on YouTube. I think that's something that tech people are probably like, pursue this now, if they aren't already. If they aren't already, I wonder what's wrong with them. <laughs> so the, the alternative right now is, first of all, the thing with YouTube streaming is the thumbnails are completely separate from the streams, unlike on Twitch. On Twitch, your thumbnail is basically some recent stream moment, and the mouse over preview for your VODs is basically key, you know, pictures of your stream from start to finish. So people can get like a 15 second preview of a lot of stuff in the stream. YouTube's isn't that robust, and YouTube has nothing right now, actually. So you have to attach a thumbnail before you even start streaming. So if you don't have something beforehand, then uh, what do you do? So but you have to make something real quick or whatever, or it's going to be some generic thing. So here's what's available right now for the start soon thing. And this is why I'm talking about Twitch features too, because Twitch is coming out with a competitor to this. You can schedule a stream. If you schedule it really close to when you're starting, give time for the notifications to go out without you having to make a big commitment. Yeah, I'll be here tomorrow at seven. If you're the kind of person with a less fixed streaming schedule like me, or you're just doing it as a, as a side thing for live events or live commentaries and stuff. And just, you don't, you know, you know, you're not going to get a lot of people because people don't know when to expect you, but it'll turn into a YouTube video after the fact and people can watch it then. So it's no big loss if they're not live, especially when your chat's all quiet, except for a couple people stopping by every so often. Howdy, folks. So here's the thing. Here's the alternative to a start soon screen. You 
do that thing 15 minutes, half hour before you start your stream. The, the stream page is generated with a thumbnail. People can go to it. And it's a, it's a static graphic, so, yeah, you know, it's a static graphic, so it's boring. So what I'd like to see YouTube do is take that loopable video thing for premieres or whatever it was, put it onto streams so that you can have your start soon screen uploaded once and use it for multiple streams. So if you have something that's looped, it resides in one place on YouTube systems. And then it's just, it's just married up to the meat of your stream, which you get started with when you actually go live. You don't actually need a proper start soon screen anymore and you don't have all that data being taken up in the files that are stored on the uh, servers. So, but it's boring. You only have a static graphic and a countdown timer that's generated by YouTube's UI. It's not actual video, it's web elements. So they would have to make that a little more interesting for more streamers to get on board with it. But fundamentally, just from a tech perspective, I don't think start soon screens have a future. Now, what about Twitch? They're going to be left out in the cold. Well, they just, they've announced a starting soon shelf to show you streamers going live in a certain amount of time, like streamers that are going to go live soon or something. Hmm. So that could cut down on the need for start soon screens as well. If you're going to start your stream at 11 and you do this on there, you show up in the shelf People tune in, they have your, your channel ready to go, and you get started without having all that video going into repetitive, redundant stuff that people argue about whether it people bounce from it. And I know there's people out there that do, because I've seen it happen on my own streams. I'll lose a concurrent or something because I haven't started yet, so to speak. So people don't want to tune in. Oh, they went live. Oh, it's going to be this loop for the next 10 minutes. Now nah, I'll come back in 10 minutes. And then something else catches their attention and they never come back. So that's that's also something the streamers have to be concerned about as well with start soon screens. And there was this big argument between Harris Heller and Devin Nash about what start soon screens and stuff. And neither of them talked about it from the tech perspective. But here I am today doing exactly that, filling in this this gap in the discussion. But I will say, though, Twitch's thing for the start soon shelf is not exclusive to the streamers. This needs to be individualized for specific streamers in order for it to work. I think it's a stopgap, but it's going to be half cooked compared to the YouTube equivalent, which individual streamers can do by scheduling their streams in advance, giving people a page they can have open for when you actually get started. So you don't need to start soon screen, except it'll be more boring graphics plus a timer. Whoop de doo. So replace the static graphics of that thumbnail with something that loops similar to what they're setting up. They're setting something like that up for premieres and stuff for premieres that haven't started yet before the countdown begins. So a lot of things YouTube could do that would f really improve their platform and the relationship between live and after the fact, just by modifying some features that they're already working on for other places besides premieres and stuff. So at some point I gotta do a reaction to the, to this video, but not as part of the stream, it would be completely off topic. So could always do a hard cut on the stream and come back for it. But I really don't think it's a good idea to really get into that. Not now, anyways. Bottom line, though. This competition between Twitch and YouTube is why all these improvements are happening on either side. Because that's what competition does. It makes companies want to do things better so they can be better than the others and win. If they don't have a fighting spirit within them, I don't know what... I, if they have no fighting spirit left, so to speak, then I don't know what to say. Hmm. So that's the situation when it comes to Twitch and YouTube with the competition and stuff like that. It's something good as far as I'm concerned. It is something good. And quite frankly, if people want to play along with this and check it out, don't be upset with them. So in my case, you know, I have a lot more variety now that I can do besides tinkering with computers all the time. And quite frankly... It gives me a better perspective on live versus after the fact and YouTube versus Twitch. And it makes me appreciate some things better and not be fishbowled by some of YouTube's issues as much. I don't know if any of you folks were any of you folks watching right now may have seen some of the complaint videos I did about YouTube issues like four or five years ago or the various things I did over the years where I was upset about this YouTube thing and. I probably would, if I had a better perspective beside YouTube, I probably would not have been as upset as I was.
These are videos I've since taken down that they're really they don't really represent what it is that I want this channel to be about. And I don't think anybody's really going to care about them. There's dumb little rants that I did as vlogs. There's some radio style commentaries out there that are along these lines. But quite frankly, you know, just watch the progression of what I can do, what I choose to do and how I do things, as well as investing in new equipment. And I can definitely say 2020 has been a net plus for getting this channel back to the multimedia stuff that it should have been about all along, which will include technology, will include computers, will include gaming PCs, will include electronics, will include tinkering with stuff around the house, but not any one specific thing, just all a big umbrella of stuff that you know a multimedia nerd like myself is messing around with. So, I also refined my Twitch channel, by the way, to reflect the gaming focus that it's going to have in the coming months and whatnot. We just got to figure out this affiliate thing. If I don't get it because of, if I don't get it with my three concurrent average right now, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and that number will go up because I'm going out of my way to look for underrepresented games that people may be like, oh yeah. And then I've had some people tune in on the Twitch streams that are like, that love the nostalgia like a Super Nintendo game or something. And they're like, yeah, I used to play this too. And it's fun in that respect that we're just presenting these games in their proper context instead of, you know, a speed run or something. Speed runners are cool. You know, they do some pretty awesome stuff, but it's not the way you're going to experience the game if you play it. So if you want to comment on the game or you just want to have fun playing it and just show it off, then the speed runners aren't doing that. It's a different environment when you're going for like a record on Mario 64, 70 stars. So that that's something I don't think is really well represented on Twitch. And it's an ongoing issue that I, I've heard streamers complain about. They, the big streamers who are full time, so they have to pay their bills with their streaming revenue. The big time, the big full time streamers, well, merch and other stuff, too, but they're limited because they have to pay the bills now with what it is they're doing. The full-time streamers complain that Twitch is f pressuring them into playing popular games instead of what they really want to play, stuff they'd have more fun playing. And that's something I think that the platform's going to have to figure out. But this competition is a good thing. Cheers. And quite frankly, I think it's about time that content creators started having a little agency to what they're doing. Not a talent agency, but just the feeling of, I am what I am. And I am not defined by a platform. And so whoever's good at what, that's where I'm going to put stuff. I'm not going to copy everything everywhere. I'm going to give people good reasons to go to every single platform that I'm involved in. Because each one of them is unique. Each one of them is cool. Each one of them has reasons why people would want to stop by and check out what it is that they do. And it's a lot easier that way because you know this goes there, that goes there, etc. And you play the platforms to their strengths and you encourage this competition. Because each of these platforms should get better. This is the other part of the discussion about diversification that some people talk about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a break for a bit. I think the storm's coming to an end, so power is still on. Woo! -hoo! I'm going to take a break for a bit and we'll revisit this whole thing, particularly with the Creator Insider video later on. I think I should definitely fire up debate mode or react mode for the Creator Insider video that came out that's talking about these new live updates, because I was wondering when somebody from the live team was going to be in one of those videos. The last time I saw one of those, there were two managers involved in live, I think, that, were, that introduced me to the idea that YouTube's working on a raids feature. So it's good to finally see an update on things. And a timetable for what they're working on, early 2021. Nice to see some timetables finally, instead of, yeah, we're working on this. Okay, when? Uh, <laughs> good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Yeah, no music this time and anything. The discussion was supposed to be a lot more serious, and uh, I guess it kind of went in the other direction. Either way, social media is youtube.com slash multimedia j, twitter.com slash multimedia j, twitch.tv slash multimedia j, multimedia j dot wordpress dot com, and multimedia j tv on Instagram. It's really too bad that YouTube doesn't have a raids feature. We probably could, you know, go go somewhere else if I could find something else, but YouTube has to update their UI before that becomes really viable at this point. We've talked about that previously. Till next time, this is Multimedia J signing off. Thanks for stopping by and stay safe, those of you putting up with this Nor'easter. Thank <laughs> you.